All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm Sean Menifee, president of AUGS. I want to start off the morning with a statement about the importance of all of us coming together during this difficult time. In the spirit of collaboration, AUGS, SUFU, SGS have joined together to develop and host this educational event. Welcome. Well, hello, I'm uh, Sandra Vasavada, president of SUFU, and I'd like to echo Sean's comments that this is a fantastic collaborative effort between our societies focused on FPMRS uh, fellow education. I think you'll find these webinars to represent the who's who in FPMRS, and uh, it's a diverse group of topics that you'll find both compelling and engaging. And hi, I'm Peter Rosenblatt, past president of the Society of Gondecologic Surgeons. Uh, just, you know, the purpose of this webinar is to supplement the education of our FPMRS fellows during the COVID-19 pandemic. While elective surgery and office visits are on hold for the next month or two. And we hope to have these webinars often during this time period to fill that educational gap. So, with that, I'll hand it over to my senior fellow, Will Winkleman, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, and welcome to the first um, webinar in the Fellows Webinar Series. And thanks again to the societies for all their support. Uh, today's webinar is Understanding Your Patient's Surgical History, and this is presented by. Dr. Charlie Reardon. Dr. Reardon grew up in Philadelphia. He attended Williams College where he majored in English. Then went on to complete his residency training at Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston and his fellowship at Mount Auburn in Cambridge. Since completing his training, he's been a faculty member at Brown where he currently serves as the chief, surgical, the chief of surgical operations at Women and Infants Hospital. And he's also served as the SGS program chair and the OGS president. Our panelists today will include Dr. Peter Rosenblatt and Dr. Roger Goldberg. Dr. Reardon will give us a brief 30 to 40 minute presentation and then we'll open up the discussion to the panelists and to questions from the audience. Uh, before we begin, I just wanna go through some housekeeping items. So this webinar is being recorded and is also being live streamed. Um, participants will all be on mute. So please use the Q and A feature of the Zoom webinar to ask any questions. We'll address those towards the end. Um, the chat feature is um, going to be monitored by members at AUG staff who will be monitoring and can assist with any technical issues. Um, and finally, at the end of the survey, you'll be prompted to answer a brief survey um, about feedback, any sort of advice that you might have for our webinar series going forward. Um, we really want these to be as valuable as they can be, so please give us, give us your candid feedback. Um, and then in case anyone has to leave early, I do just want to let you know that our next webinar will be on Tuesday, April 14th at 5 p.m. And that will be on rectal vaginal fistulas. And that'll have Dr. Patrick Culligan presenting and panelists Kim Kenton and Keisha Dyer. And on that, I'll pass it over to Dr. Reardon to start his talk. Okay. Uh, will, I think you need to unshare your screen. Okay. Okay. All right. <clears throat> well, very good. Um, thanks to all of you. And I am uh, very appreciative of the collaboration with which this has come together in a remarkable time. Uh, my gratitude goes to AUGS and SGS and SUFU for working together uh, to really try to meet the educational needs that are uh, in many cases kind of put on hold uh, for this time being. So with that, I want to go ahead and get into uh, a little um, stroll down memory lane uh, for some of us uh, of what our, our patients uh, have been offered and have undergone. Um, there are a couple reasons for this, but I, I want to start off with my disclosures. This is all institutional research support. I don't get to keep any of this. Um, but the objectives to explain the anatomic features of the implants um, and associated uh, procedures and devices related to pelvic floor disorders treatments. Um, to equip you with the knowledge they're needing to provide uh, care for these patients who may be having iatrogenic issues um, that are no longer commonly performed. Um, and I think beyond that too, there's a lot of um, uh, value to learning what those before us um, have done. Why do we learn them? Well, you'll be likely called upon to care for them, who, uh, for patients who've undergone these procedures and understanding them uh, will be in the patient's best interests. I also think there's a fascinating process of understanding the build and building blocks of the way that our current procedures have been put together um, and how they inform our knowledge of pelvic floor function, um, but additionally, how we can sort of continue the process of evolution of our technologies and instrumentation 
um, in a way that will uh, be beneficial for our patients. <clears throat> this is an image from a Pat Culligan uh, um, paper a while ago, uh, calls it the, um, the family tree of transvaginal mesh systems. Uh, this specifically refers to some of the FDA um, processes for clearance uh, for devices. I'm not going to get too far into the FDA processes, although they are fascinating. Um, but this is just to say uh, an example of how um, these uh, devices sort of build upon each other. One is predicated upon the next, um, and the next iteration uh, may be an existential shift or be a, a, might be a minor variation, um, but understanding sort of where it came from uh, in a uh, technological sense. So let's start with looking at uh, uh, incontinence, stress incontinence. Now, of course, there's probably about seven different mechanisms by which uh, stress continence, uh, that is to say the normal state occurs. Uh, we're really only good at fixing one of them. Um, and that is this concept of urethral support. So here, this concept that this uh, uh, vaginal fiber muscularis attached to the arcus tendineus on either side underneath the urethra such that when a cough or sneeze occurs, there's pressure on the urethra from above that is met with an equal and opposite uh, co-apting force from below by nature of this uh, supportive tissue. And uh, as I say, this is the only thing that we're very good at manipulating surgically. Um, so whether it's a birch copal suspension or a traditional pubovaginal sling, uh, this is probably the mechanism by which these procedures are working been a variety of iterations uh, of these things. So the needle suspension or the needle urethropexy, the NUP, um, this concept that uh, the, we're using sutures uh, pass through the retropubic space, somehow providing support to the vaginal tissue underneath the urethra, uh, whether it's uh, conceptually restoring the pubo-urethral uh, ligament uh, support. Um, uh, technologically, there are several different ways to do it, but the concept was similar, using the abdominal wall to uh, provide support to the vaginal fiber muscularis, the vaginal wall underneath the urethra. Uh, a couple ways this got done procedurally for those of you who have probably, uh, those fellows uh, on the line have never seen any one of these, um, but the concept was to develop these vaginal flaps to uh, place a series of sutures um, through some part or maybe all, we'll get into some of that, of the uh, vaginal fiber muscularis on either side of the urethra. Uh, and then to use some form of a needle um, passer guide passed through the uh, retropubic space. Those of you trained in doing retropubic um, mid-urethral slings from a top-down fashion, uh, this part of the procedure will look familiar, uh, passing this needle through the ret uh, an undissected retropubic space, um, but then using that needle guide to then uh, bring those needles, uh, excuse me, the sutures out through the anterior abdominal wall, and then somehow affixing them to the uh, um, abdominal wall itself. Uh, this is a version of a, a STAMI procedure, um, which used a bolster. Uh, the concern was, uh, the observation was made that these sutures kept pulling out of the uh, vaginal fiber muscularis, um, especially if you're not doing full thickness, so they're adding some sort of physical support. Uh, these bolsters were used in some cases. Um, uh, the ones that I have seen personally, uh, that is to say I've taken them out, um, uh, were made of Gore-Tex vascular graft. Um, so another case where we borrowed um, some technology from another field and uh, tried to employ it in the uh, hopes of making our own surgeries perform a little bit better. This is kind of a, a schematic of different versions of retropubic, uh, um, sorry, a needle urethropexies. Uh, the Giddies procedure, you can see those sutures were designed to uh, pass full thickness through the uh, vaginal wall, including the, um, the epithelium. The STAMI procedure, as we talked about before, using a bolster uh, rather than trying to use the vaginal wall itself. Uh, the RAS procedure was kind of a combination. Again, trying to keep, leave, uh, the goal was to leave those sutures um, extra uh, epithelial. epithelial. Um, so, you know, there have been many, many surgeries uh, defined for uh, stress incontinence. Um, in 1997, the uh, uh, AUA, uh, took a look at the five most predominant features uh, or um, versions, uh, categories of incontinence procedures. And they really uh, decided that anterior corporophy as an incontinence procedure, and then, uh, uh, sorry, there's something deformatting on this version. Uh, those lines were meant to go through the uh, needle suspension and anterior corporophy. 
um, were really rejected as not having enough efficacy um, to really be considered as an anti-incontinence procedure. So that left us with slings, um, uh, retropubic urethropexies, and of course the periurethral injections. Um, birch procedures, um, which uh, at least for many of us uh, were preferable or more uh, readily performed than um, uh, Marshall Marchetti Krantz procedures, but the concept again, this is a, a laparoscopic version um, using a, a, a permanent suture of some kind, uh, taking a double bite. This is the Tanago modification of the birch, a double bite of the uh, vaginal fiber muscularis, excluding the epithelium. Um, one suture at the level of the mid urethra, one set of suture at the urethra vesicle junction, um, and then using that those sutures to affix it to Cooper's ligament um, and thereby provide the support. Um, this is what the Birch procedure looks like. I still think of uh, Fleming Maddox in my in my mind, I hear his voice uh, when around the uh, year 2000, 2001, in his inevitable way, he said, Birch is dead because the uh, mid urethral sling had gained in such popularity. I find it's interesting. I have always tried to do one or two of these a month so that my fellows would be familiar with it and that we never um, lost the ability to provide it. Uh, as a bit of an aside, um, I do feel it's important that for almost any condition, uh, a woman has a mesh-based or a not mesh-based way of getting that done. There may be strong preferences. She should be adv well advised and counseled. But I think that if we only have one trick in our, in our, uh, up our sleeve, then, then we're not doing the patients the best service that we can. But especially in the early days of laparoscopy, uh, when people were less familiar with suturing uh, techniques, this was difficult. This was a challenge. Uh, people weren't so used to the needle and thread and the tying of knots. So in order to uh, sort of reconstitute a laparoscopic procedure in a way that was more uh, doable, um, some people had devised uh, this mesh and staple technique wherein uh, uh, two strips of mesh were used um, to, uh, and then attached to Cooper's ligament and to the um, vaginal fiber muscularis. Um, and instead of sutures, there would be these mesh and staple uh, apparatus. Um, conceptually, perhaps sound, but uh, in, in uh, practice, a uh, bit of a challenge. Uh, so here's uh, examples of these helical um, uh, corkscrews, these uh, fixation devices, uh, misfired, misapplied. Here's one that goes through and through to both sides of the bladder. Um, and or just in terms of technique, uh, sometimes, especially uh, in, that, uh, in the crevice of the paravaginal space, it's hard to get these uh, sutures to fire right, or excuse me, the, the uh, staples. And so if you see here in this x-ray, you see just an enormous collection of, uh, of some of these um, uh, staples as they had been misfired um, and kind of collected uh, into these spaces. So for the sake of time, I'm not gonna uh, show this video unless we develop time later, but essentially this is me digging into the retropubic space on both sides and taking out kind of large wads of uh, encapsulated uh, titanium screws. Uh, so that wasn't really a very uh, successful version of a modified laparoscopic birch procedure. And that's why I put the quotes around birch because if you're gonna do something fundamentally different, call it something different. Um, so, okay, so maybe we should use uh, sutures, but again, suturing's hard. Surely one uh, set of sutures is as good as two, right? Well, no, the answer is no. Uh, the objective failure um, and uh, the uh, improvement rates uh, really did correspond to doing the procedure the way it was meant to do, be done with two sutures on either side. So this was sort of the learning curve uh, as people were developing laparoscopic approaches to a retropubic urethropexy. So then we enter the sort of the, 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 the era of kits, this idea of a kit. Um, it is certainly true that everybody has their own minute variations on what a birch procedure looks like. Um, and even uh, recto, um, rectus fascia sling are different from provider to provider. This concept of having something reproducible in a kit was tempting. So the vesica system had a number of different iterations, but the concept was some sort of kit device using a sling um, uh, underneath the urethra in sort of a combination fashion. Um, in many of these uh, systems, there was a bone anchor uh, that went into the pubic bone uh, one way or another, and that was the point of fixation. 
um, that that uh, fairly substantial piece of metal was driven into the retro into the backside or upper side of the pubic bone uh, as a convenient anchor uh, for support. Um, this is what the rest of the system looked like, um, and this in this case the the uh, that may be a familiar name for, for some of you. This actually was probably the only true recall um, in uh, pelvic uh, reconstructive surgery. Um, this was, although it's polypropylene, it was very dense and it was coated in bovine uh, collagen in an effort to get the body to accept it more readily. Uh, those of you who may have had some experience with trying to put growth factors and other uh, combination of uh, or, uh, biologic and synthetic materials together at the same time, know that that story doesn't end as happily as we wanted it to. Um, but here's a, a transvaginal version of these speed tacks uh, that were designed through a vaginal dissection to uh, put these uh, screws or anchors into the backside of the pubic bone um, as, a, as an anchor system. If it strikes some of you as a little scary to put these metal tacks introduced through the vagina into the bone, um, that's not an unreasonable fear. And this is what um, uh, osteitis pubis uh, looks like on CT scan. So late 1990s, uh, enter TVT, tension-free vaginal tape. I always like to remind people it does not stand for transvaginal tape, it stands for tension-free. Uh, and we'll get to part of why that's so important. But in many ways, this was heretical at the time, right? First, it was a trocar through undissected space. Uh, it was placed at the mid-urethra. Most of us thought at the time that all the magic happened at the urethral vesicle junction or the bladder neck. It's not attached to anything. How does it hold itself? If you're not fixing it, how does it provide support? And it's tension free. In other words, it didn't change anatomy at rest. Almost all of our procedures up to this point required that A, the patient have hypermobility at the beginning of the case, and B, that they not have it at the end of the case in order for it to work. In other words, we were changing anatomy at rest. None of these things was true for TVT. And so it was viewed skeptically until it was recognized just how successful this uh, device was. I don't have to go too far into the story of TVT, but uh, uh, the next step beyond that was the TO, the TOT, the transobturator tape. Um, this concept that maybe if we can kind of avoid entering the pelvis at all, start at the urethra and go laterally, maybe we'll decrease these unusual but terrifying bowel injuries. Maybe there's less vascular injury. Maybe it performs a little bit different. Um, OBTAPE was the first one that was available in the United States. Uh, those of you who may have seen this material, again, polypropylene, but doesn't look like what we're used to. It actually, I, back before we were worried about all this PPE availability, I'd use the uh, analogy that this uh, material looked like the uh, straps you'd use to tie your surgical mask behind your head. It was essentially pressed like felt. It was essentially without uh, pores that you could see through. Um, this is what it looks like up close, kind of a waffle iron look. Um, and this is kind of what happened. Um, it turns out that it's not the molecule that you make your uh, device out of that matters. It's the weave um, and all the, the, uh, the ways that that knitting uh, interplays that has a, has a profound effect on how it performs. Uh, so this is obturator tape. Uh, the first one was not a success story for us. The uh, ob tape um, performed uh, poorly. Uh, as a result of the materials. This is one that I personally took care of. Um, she, the general surgeon had no idea why she kept getting necrotizing fasciitis in the thigh because they had no, uh, no reason to attach this to the uh, vaginal procedure that she'd had done a, a few months before. Um, and I can understand why they wouldn't be able to link that together because it's gyne gynecologist hadn't been operating in the groin before that. This is, you can see, the white area there uh, in the groin, which is where this uh, recurring infection was. I had to go in conjunction with my plastics person, go uh, looking for the tape remnant within this. I actually couldn't find it. And it turns out it, uh, the uh, implanting surgeon had done some degree of uh, removing it within the first week of placing it. And that had caused the uh, uh, thigh end of the tape to retract so that it wasn't until I explored this super tiny little sinus tract vaginally and was able to identify a fiber or two and pull out the remnant of this ob tape. And this is what had been sitting, pulled behind her uh, pubic ramus, uh, causing all this difficulty for this woman. So obturator slings, um, they still had value, but it's just we were learning that the uh, material mattered. Um, we've seen the uh, sort of iterative process, full length, 
um, TOT uh, slings, uh, they leave mesh in the groin. Um, and uh, I think if the obturator slings have an Achilles heel, um, it's groin pain. Um, so the pain or, uh, pain, these pain issues are leading some, for instance, the Scotland Independent Review uh, has recommended against uh, their use. Um, and I, you know, as I always tell, tell folks, if you have an exposure or something wrong with the mesh under the urethra, well, that certainly wasn't my plan and I'm sorry, but the mesh has to be there in order to work. I've always had the suspicion that the mesh doesn't need to be left in the groin in order for this TOT to work. So sort of the next iterations became the partial length but multi-incision. So the TBT Abrevo and the Dasara SL are both devices that are essentially introduced in an inside to out, uh, actually can do either in some cases, uh, fashion, but uh, once you're fully deployed, there's no mesh left in the groin. And then the, the next step beyond this would be the single incision uh, procedures um, that uh, usually involve some sort of anchoring system in the obturator membrane. So you continue, you continue to see the sort of step-by-step -step evolution of the obturator tape. Well, let's take a look. Yes, here's the famous, uh, Peter, this is your picture and it's, uh, I see it in almost every prolapse talk. So I wanted to be part of that crowd as well. Um, but uh, vaginal vault prolapse and some of the uh, historical procedures and some of the um, uh, device-based um, iterations that we've gone through. Uh, sacrospinous ligament fixation, of course, helped popularized by uh, uh, my predecessor here at Brown, David Nichols, um, as well as some others. But uh, the entrance into the uh, pararectal space where the sacrospinous ligament lives, you can get into that space with an anterior or posterior, or in fact, apical approach, depending on what else you want to be doing at the time. And you can do it with or without mesh. So this is this direct fixation here. Um, but you can also take this concept of, uh, of, a, of using um, the reliable uh, architecture of the sacrospinous ligaments and attaching mesh directly to the um, sacrospinous ligaments and then attaching the vagina to the mesh. Uh, you, well, those of you fellows will certainly know that one contraindication to a traditional sacrospinous fixation is vaginal foreshortening such that the vagina can't make it to the ligament. Uh, so this bridging technique um, with uh, back originally with the uh, mesh that we would cut ourselves and some sort of trapezoid um, was sort of that first um, uh, venture into mesh augmented uh, apical suspensions uh, done vaginally. Um, this next device uh, through our uh, parade of uh, technology was uh, the infracoxygeal sacropexy. I've been looking at that term for a long time and I still can't quite make sense of the words. But the concept was a trocar-based device um, passing through the sacrospinous ligament, but from the outside to the inside of the pelvis, and then using that as a tunneling system to attach one end of what's effectively a sling, but being used for apical suspension, and doing the same thing on the other side and using that to attach the vagina up. So essentially it is a, a, a trocar-based way of using uh, that mesh attachment to the sacrospinous ligaments as an indirect way to hold up the vaginal vault. This is sort of what it looks like here. And yes, it did take a little while for people to get used to gynecologists making an incision lateral and posterior to the anus, uh, introducing these, uh, the tunneler device. Uh, you're outside the levators now. You're basically in the ischial rectal fossa and passing, it, uh, passing those trocars from the outside to the inside through the sacrospinous ligament and using that to attach this um, uh, mesh, which is then attached to the top of the vagina. And by pulling on these um, uh, uh, sling ends, these mesh tips on the outside of the body, effectively like a pair of pulleys, you're pulling the vaginal vault back inside. Uh, actually, it's interesting. You could use the very same device, um, the very same kit, the same box um, to place a sling at the same time. Uh, so IVS actually stands for um, uh, the um, uh, intravaginal sling plasty. Um, so this is a different way of introducing it. So uh, the short answer here is these uh, devices were not flawed necessarily by their uh, architecture, by their anatomic approach, um, but, but rather by the materials. And so this was as, we, again, we were beginning to learn that the poor dent, sorry, the uh, pore size, the uh, material density, uh, a variety of other factors uh, factor enormously into how the body is going to accept these um, uh, devices over time and how they will perform. Um, so uh, that's what we're, uh, that's the uh, IVS tunneler there. 
And um, uh, really this was uh, essentially undone by really very high uh, mesh exposure and, and in fact, true mesh infection rates um, as a result of the material that was selected. A variety of vaginal grafts have been used. Again, it is uh, the most understandable thing I can think of that uh, surgeons, um, nobody likes failures. Uh, we're always trying to make things more durable and robust. Um, and uh, it's in our interest and in our patient's interest to develop something that works better. So um, this uh, idea of augmenting or reinforcing uh, some of our uh, transvaginal approaches uh, made sense. Here's a traditional corporophy. Here's the idea of a, of a biologic graft uh, attached to the arcus on either side uh, in the hopes this might give some more durable repair. And of course, you can use mesh if uh, uh, through that approach as well. You can do that in any compartment um, of uh, adding a, um, a graft over a, a, a traditional repair or in, in fact, instead of a traditional repair. These concepts became, started to undergo major modifications. Um, partly this was due to the enthusiasm of uh, quote unquote tension free placement. This idea of placing, instead of suturing something in place, uh, much like we learned with the retropubic slings, if you simply place them where you want them to be and then take the sheath off, they tend to hold themselves in place. It's like a thousand little anchors or a piece of Velcro. So people started um, putting their minds to work to figure out ways to have this kind of concept um, play out in a way that um, uh, lent itself to um, uh, prolapse repairs. So a variety of different ones of these, this is a total prolift. And I'll show a little bit more about that. Uh, there's the Avolta procedure, the perigee, um, a, a variety of different procedures. Uh, here on the uh, left, you see this is an anterior Avolta. You could also do a posterior Avolta. Um, and if you did a trans obturator tape sling as well, that person had 10 sling uh, arms going through the groin. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's just as a feature of the, um, of the architecture of the device. Um, this is sort of what that introducer might look like as it passes from outside the levator uh, from the ischial recta fossa back in through at this point, this is coming through the uh, proximal arcus tendineus just at the level of the ischial spine. This would be done again much more distally uh, up in this area here and using those as uh, trocar passage devices to bring these sling arms through. So this is just a quick video of a schematic of, of how this, and we're shifting back to a total prolift, um, but just to give you a sense of what this looked like and how uh, the process would go. So this piece of mesh as it came out of the box was pretty enormous. You could tie it completely around your head. This is the way it's designed to finally look like in its deployment. You can see that it's kind of encircling the vagina entirely. Um, has the entire anterior compartment replaced with mesh, significant part of the posterior compartment, and is in fact using that sacrospinous ligament as sort of the linchpin of support. Uh, it's trying to recreate the arcus tendineus of the fascia pelvis and trying to uh, recreate some of that apical support uh, of the um, uterosacral ligaments by way of the sacrospinous. Passing the trocars again from outside the levators, penetrating through the sacrospinous ligament and into the points of your dissection. Looking at it from the side, here's the, uh, the surgeon's finger has dissected into the pararectal space. There's the ischial spines and of course the sacrospinous ligament. Here's that same trocar entry point, lateral and posterior to the anus, introducing through under tactile guidance pushing it and coming through the sacrospinous ligament. The cannula was cleverly devised, so it had this little bend on it, so that when you sent this suture uh, leader, um, a suture retrieval device through the trocar, it came back into your surgical field. This picture, which I think is meant to reassure you that you're not that close to nerves and vessels, I'm not sure it has that effect of reassuring me. But in any case, this is some of the major uh, vasculature. Of course, you see the pudendal and the inferior gluteal artery nearby but this is the concept that you're traversing this space uh, with the cannula and then the suture leader. Then at that point, once you've got the suture leaders, uh, you apply, in this case, this is just the posterior portion of the prolift through that le uh, suture leader uh, retrieval device. And then you basically pull it back through uh, the trocar, excuse me, the cannula. 
um, and the same thing through here. And then as you pull the cannula out, uh, you basically leave those mesh arms in place. They are now traversing through the sacrospinous, lig sacrospinous ligaments on either side, um, giving you uh, durable support. Um, that's what a posterior uh, would look like. And again, here is a complete uh, total uh, prolift with an obturator um, sling. In this case, you have eight sling arms coming through the groin. It does look a little bit like a lunar lander or some sort of insect device. Um, but that was the enthusiasm at the time for a kit-based, um, trocar-based approach uh, to prolapse. Um, certainly, as we began to see some complications from, again, mesh residing in a place where it doesn't actually need to be, it's just a leftover of how we got the mesh in place. Uh, there was a move then to, as I put it at the time, trying to return sur pelvic surgery back to keep it inside the pelvis. So the idea of avoiding these trocars that pass through the ischial rectal fossa and leave mesh in those places um, made sense. So uh, whether it's the, um, uh, the Elevate kit, uh, the Uphold or the Pinnacle procedures, some of these other procedures that basically were still using um, self-retaining mesh uh, in the uh, sacrospinous ligament as the key feature of support, but not passing uh, trocars and mesh through the ischial rectal fossa. Um, so these were the, uh, these were the kits that um, uh, were available most recently. Um, this is the uphold procedure, uh, a version of that, which are really one of the last two. Um, and that's where I'll end my slides, but um, I do want to point out, and we'll get to this a little bit, um, th these uh, most recently in, uh, you know, this past year, um, the FDA declined to approve uh, the two transvaginal mesh kits uh, that were under their uh, assessment at the time. Um, I see all the time that uh, mesh kits have, have been recalled. Uh, that is not factually correct. Um, and that the, the FDA has banned transvaginal mesh. That is uh, also factually incorrect. Um, but uh, this sort of was, uh, and I, I know we'll have some conversation about that, but this was sort of the evolution of both incontinence and prolapse um, kits um, and sort of what they were based on and what some of their flaws were. Um, and at this point, I think we're going to go ahead and open it back up to uh, a panel. Um, I will unshare my screen. And I think we have, I know there's been some chat that I haven't had a chance to get to, um, but I know that we'll, um, um, yeah. Okay. So uh, Roger and Peter, you want to join in? And... Okay, well, thanks, thanks for that excellent presentation. Um, again, I just want to open up to the panelists um, and kind of before before moving on to questions from the audience, do either of you kind of have any any comments or any things that you want to bring up? Um, otherwise, I'll go go to some of the some of the questions that we have. Uh, the only thing I I, I bring up is uh, Charlie. Great presentation, by the way. Um, the other uh, types of STEMI, STEMI also use Dacron pledgets as well as Gore-Tex. So you might come across Dacron is Mersaline. So you might and they were you, I think they were like arterial grafts. Right, so the vascular grafts, yeah. Right, so you may come across different things that are called sure. stamy. Yeah. Yeah, there was any sort of bolster at all, and I think they would often borrow just whatever they found in their in their closet. Right. right. Charlie, I'll, I'll uh, interject with a question here. You had mentioned you're doing about two birches a month, or on average. I know that was an estimate. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if I could probe you a little bit on that. I mean, obviously, the, the Cochrane reviews, the meta-analyses, and most of the individual studies on birch versus sling give advantage to sling, mid to mm -hmm. sling. And just as a as a trainer, as a as an educator, what how do you see our goals? When you see uh, who's your typical birch patient, when do you feel it's justified? And maybe even more broadly, do you think we should aspire to really have all fellows learn this procedure, or is it just in the hands of of, of docs that commit to doing them often enough? Well, I think those are great questions. My own approach is that because I have found enough other reasons to be surgically involved in the retropubic space laparoscopically, whether it's dealing with a mesh complication, taking a sling out, um, other things like that, I, I wanted to make sure my fellows were comfortable in that territory. Mm -hmm. So I felt like this was something I wanted to keep um, alive surgically. With regards to how I counsel a patient between the two, I am very clear that over 90% of what I do for incontinence, and, and certainly much more than that, that most of the world does for incontinence is a mid urethral sling. And I consider that the gold standard. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, uh, that I think that um, uh, a retropubic urethropexy is not a better procedure. It takes mm -hmm. a little bit longer. Uh, I require a little bit more post-op uh, activity restrictions for any sort of native tissue-based repair. Slings are strong right away. Right. Um, and I, I'm very clear that I say the, the likelihood of needing some sort of reoperation for this sling, whether it's an exposure or something else, is on the order of three to four percent, which means right. that ninety-six percent of it is behaving beautifully. Yeah. So it's uh, so I uh, and and as you say, whether it's the sister trial or some of the other ones um, that have have shown advantage, Birch. Um, but for some people who do walk in, and I'm sort of surprised how quickly they can get talked off the ledge of the scary mesh commercials that they probably saw in my waiting room. Um, but for the people who are firmly uh, of the of the um, mind that they don't want mesh. Um, I feel like we should be able to meet them where they live. Um, and to, if I can express to them why I, more, I do more slings than birches, and they still wind up wanting to avoid mesh, um, but I, I, I don't want to do a rectus fascia sling if I can help it. Uh, I think that there still is some role for that. Roger, the only other thing I'll add to that is, uh, although we don't like to think about it, um, I guess there's always the possibility that slings, we know slings are in the crosshairs, uh, of the plaintiff attorneys. And I, I think we're okay, but we can't be 100% sure and we don't wanna be left with nothing in our toolbox. So I, you know, we, we still do in our center, of not, a, not a lot of birches, but I do a fair number of laparoscopic paravaginals, which is getting into the, you know, obviously the same space, basically same dissection. So I, I think it's incumbent on us to train people to do the procedure that we might have to do if slings get taken away. And the only other thing I'd add, Roger, is is back in the days of exuberant enthusiasm for some of these mesh kits, and I think we all saw some of the ones that did not go well. Um, but I remember talking to a, a young 33-year-old or something who had essentially asymptomatic stage two prolapse and, and a, a significant mesh kit put in. And her recollection, granted this may not be the accurate truth, but her rec recollection was that the implanting provider says, this is the only way I do this. If you want this fixed, this is how I'm gonna do it. And I, I just, I think we should hold ourselves to a standard that involves the patient in shared decision-making. Uh, agree, it's an interesting debate. I think also we have to stand firm with what we believe in mm -hmm. and yep. not be wishy-washy about the benefits of a mid-urethral sling. Cause you know, we do get it fall into the trap of the good old days that never were. We right. sort of get nostalgic about operations that really didn't fare quite as well, but all right. great points. I want to kind of go to the other side of the, the coin. We've had a few people who've asked about transvaginal mesh. Do, do any of you kind of see a role of transvaginal mesh in the future, kind of given what's going on right now? Is that something, are you offering patients any of those procedures? And maybe you could each speak a little bit about your, your experience with that. Well, I'll just start first. I, I'm interested to hear the other ones too, but as I made a point of saying the FDA has not banned, nor is it their jurisdiction to ban a technique they simply failed to allow for the marketing of a certain set of devices. So I really feel fairly strongly like some patients individualized, their best approach may be a transvaginal mesh for prolapse. Um, and that what I would do at advise is again, let them know the situation. I would add on my consent form for this surgery, I understand this is off label use. Oh. Yeah, you froze from for a moment, Charlie. Um, while while he's freezing, uh, Roger, do you want to talk? Uh, sure. Um, you know the uh, our experience with with transvaginal mesh. Specifically oh, sorry. That's okay, Charlie. You froze up for a while. Um, so our, our our my two cents on that. We we have a had a decade plus experience with with uphold specifically. So for us at this present time, uh, you know, the gaps that we see, that was a very handy way for um, us to deal with large anterior apical prolapses with recurrent cases and with uterine preservation. It was, a, it was sort of a core procedure for us. Am I doing transvaginal mesh now? No, mainly because a bit of post-traumatic stress of the whole experience of these procedures being stripped off the shelves. Would I hesitate based on the pros and cons we saw in the past? Um, no, and I think uh, having spoken directly with the FDA, I know that they had no um, great issues with the idea of docs uh, within their own expertise using uh, 
cut mesh or existing uphold at that time um, to perform the procedures. Um, having said that, I think the key operative word there is within your skill set. So if you have a comfortable experience, a previous experience with transvaginal mesh, um, as we do at our center, uh, this is something that may have a clinical role, but in, in full disclosure, I have not done that up till now. Yeah, Charlie, you're back now. Do you want to want to finish your thought? I don't know where it... Yeah, sorry. So I was, I was just going to say that um, uh, I, I do add on the consent form for such an individualized patient that they know that I'm using this off-label. Um, mesh devices all have to be labeled for a certain indication. And if you're using it for something else, I think it's, it's good patient care to describe that you're doing it off label. Um, but that's the only extra paperwork. And I, I do think that in the right circumstance, if somebody has got recurrent, you know, you don't want to keep doing the same procedure that just failed and keep doing native tissue repairs when the last one failed. I don't think that's a doing the patient a service nor is a sacrocopal pexy in all patients who have complex surgical histories in the abdomen. So um, I, I think we should, we should not abandon the technique uh, entirely. Yeah, the, the only thing I'll add to that, I, I agree totally with what you're saying. Um, I've done very few transvaginal mesh procedures since this ban went into effect. Um, I did have a patient who actually was scheduled for, for an uphold and then it got taken away from us, so we had to improvise. But I just say that I think in the future, if and when I offer it, it uh, and I, 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 I'd like to know if you guys agree with this, it won't include a trans obturator or a trans gluteal approach. It'll be a direct fixation uh, with, without the, uh, you know, without these uh, arms. Uh, now, it does mean that you have to do your adjustment kind of right, uh, because you don't have that ability to adjust after you close the incision like you would with uh, some of these other procedures, but I, th but I think with experience, as Roger said, you know your skill set, and I, I, so I think there is a role. Agree. Um, and, and something I, you know, another question that's come up in the discussion board is, um, you know, it's it's more and more common that as as fellows, we're seeing patients in clinic who have had a prior had a prior mesh procedure. They often aren't sure it was years ago. Um, what's your general approach to a patient that comes in who is having? issues or complications from one of these, these older procedures. Peter, why don't you start? Yeah, okay, so, so it's, a, it's a great question uh, for two reasons. Even, even if you do know what they had, by the way, let's say they had a prolift, there are doctors out there who improvise, right? And so with that anterior- or Unknowingly improvise. That's, that's right. And so uh, for, you know, the one I think of is like prolift anterior, um, which is two trans obturator passes. Some people were, were doing a direct uh, uh, sacrospinous uh, fixation or using the, um, the uh, posterior gluteal pass on the anterior to go through the sacrospinous. So people do improvise. Um, you, by the way, if you, if you don't remember everything that Charlie said, um, all of these IFUs, instructions for use, are available online. I've searched for them. They're out there. So you can see what it should look like. But uh, Will, to your point, um, you know, finding out what is the complication. Is it a band? Is it a, a strap that's tender? It's usually not the mesh itself, which is, you know, mesh is not painful inherently. It's usually where it interfaces with pelvic floor muscles or usually pelvic floor muscles. So find out where that is and um, you don't necessarily need to know what the product was. And I'll throw in a, an additional comment here, and I wouldn't have said this two years ago, but we've, in our center, we've started doing a lot of 3D pelvic ultrasound, more relating to bowel work that we're doing unrelated to this talk, but it's invaluable for patients who have an unknown prior mesh procedure with pain. We don't need the expense of an MRI necessarily to get a good look at where there's, where there's mesh. So that's just something to keep in mind. And I think this concept of being precise is often overlooked. We have docs that advocate removal of the entire mesh graft no matter what. Right. And I think that's a real problem. I think we're causing morbidity rather than yeah. um, alleviating a problem when we, when we sloppily just go after the mesh. So being pinpointed in your exam, perhaps supported by an ultrasound in the office would be my approach. Yeah, I, I wanna echo that. Um, in the, in the midst of all this COVID stuff, um, we lost an opportunity to really highlight an Augs-Iuga joint statement on, on managing mesh complications. 
Um, but we feel pretty importantly about a couple of things. First of all, especially when it comes to mesh for prolapse removal, um, the, the more you take out, the more likely you are to cause a new complication. Um, you don't wanna leave the patient untreated, but if, it, if uh, the idea of mesh extirpation, of going in with the, the only sole and only goal to remove every uh, micron of this uh, material is probably not in the patient's best interest. So I think uh, as Roger said, knowing what your strategy is and what needs to be detached or removed or have tension taken off of it um, is probably the sensible way to go. Hey, but Charlie, and, and Justin, I know you know this uh, because I know you, you write about it, uh, but the first treatment should not be surgical. Correct. Right? So many of these women can be helped with uh, pelvic floor physical therapy, with, with you know, myofascial release, not Kegel exercises, but myofascial release affecting that scar tissue of that interface between the mesh and the, and the pelvic floor muscles. And, and I'm, I'm astounded by how often people get better from that. And only if they fail that or trigger point injections should you consider some type of surgical revision. Now, one of the problems right now during COVID is that no one's doing pelvic floor physical therapy, but hopefully that will get relieved in the next you know, month or two. If, if you do have a patient who's kind of gone through, gone through all that early stuff, gone through physical therapy, tried trigger point um, injections, what is your, what's your general surgical approach or does it, does it really vary so much that you don't necessarily have a standard approach when you are thinking surgically about these patients? Well, I, I think that one of the luxuries we have in pelvic reconstructive surgery is that almost all of the tissues that we use for our support, we can get at during a physical exam. If I can't elicit her complaint during my exam, I am very, uh, uh, I am not confident that I'm gonna be able to address that surgically. Um, that you should really be able to map out whether it's digitally, whether it's ultrasound, digital I mean by with fingers, um, or ultrasound or some other way that convinces you, you know what part of the mechanical features of that mesh need to be removed or revised um, and, and to uh, approach that. So physical exam I think is, is paramount and, and know what you're planning ahead of time. Roger, do you want to chime in there? No, I think, I think that was very well said. Uh, the, you know, from, in my mind, the uh, experience has been divided into meshes that uh, look like they're obviously have been put in incorrectly, where you have um, arms that shouldn't, that are, that are in the wrong anatomic position that falls into a category that clearly we need to be more aggressive. And then there's the issue of um, hidden spaces. You know, the, I, I do think the transgluteal transobturator meshes are a different animal than a sac direct sacrospinous, where to Charlie's point, you can feel that area precisely. So it just gets a little bit more muddy, I think, for the generation one mesh kits that were transmuscular. We also have to think about why, you know, why are we going in if it's, if it's a mesh exposure in the vagina? Uh, you know, our approach has been to just um, to dissect, you know, free up the epithelium around the exposure, excise the exposure, and then bring together the epithelium without tension. Um, it is so rare, in my opinion, to have to, as, as you said, to, uh, Charlie, to have to remove the entire mesh, every little thread. Uh, if it's a pain issue, what we found uh, is that, as you said, it's, it's the straps. If, it, you know, if they, they can't be managed with physical therapy, and local therapy, then it's the straps that can be uh, transected or excised. And, and a very nice technique that I learned from my former fellow, Charlie Reardon, uh, is uh, a great um, approach, which is getting to the space that you just showed a little while ago in the space of Retzius for these trans, for these, you know, armed, forearmed uh, devices like a Volta and Prolift and uh, Perigee. And you can, with and it's easier with laparoscopic than robotic because you can get a finger in the vagina to feel where the tension is and just simply cut the mesh arms. Ha uh, Charlie has a great video. I think it's on the AUGS website, I believe. I think so. Yeah, uh, that shows this technique. It's very reproducible. We've done it several times and that has relieved pain. Uh, it's been a great, great procedure. Yeah, I think your point is that most of the time pain is caused by tension. Uh, it's not by caused by the presence of the mesh, it's caused by the tension that the combination of fibrosis and mesh has created. 
Um, and anytime somebody has been fired up to, whether it's the patient or somebody else saying, you have to have all of the mesh taken out. I think you really need to have a step back and, and, a, and a conversation there. And I've actually had a couple of patients who decided not to have that surgery with me because I would not tell them I'm not gonna leave the room until every molecule is out because I think that's dangerous and not in your interest. Kind of, kind of along those lines, how do, you, how do you all counsel your patients when you are going back for one of these, these revision sur surgeries? Well, I'll go first. I, I, first of all, I tell them what I intend to do. I don't want them to have expectations because you're right, Charlie, there are people that come in and want to have everything removed. And I have, I, I feel like I've talked people off the ledge where, it, you know, they were, people seem to attribute every one of their ills to the mesh. Uh, and if I can't reproduce it on exam and they're complaining of bowel symptoms and they have otherwise normal exams, I, I'm not going to tell them that I, that I'm going to make them all better. So, uh, but we will go in telling them what our expectation is, that there might be findings that we find in surgery that alter the plans. Uh, but I would be very reluctant to, um, for instance, uh, uh, unless someone, I, I put, put it this way, I've never dissected into the groin except for one infected mesh. Um, and if someone wanted mesh out of their groin, I don't think I would be the person to do that. Have you guys explored the groins in transoptrator? A couple of times, but it's important to stay, say that the data shows that for groin pain, most of them resolve with release of the tension vaginally. So to, to say that my goal is to take the mesh out of your groin is probably not doing the right thing for that patient. Yeah, and, and my, my addition to this to part of the discussion, you know, we, we've been lucky. I think I'm in a part of the country where we've seen less strap-based mesh, anchor-based mesh, period. So we haven't had an influx of a huge number of difficult cases. But in well-selected patients where, to Charlie's previous point, if you identify the point of tenderness on exam and you're precise with your goals, I'm very optimistic with those patients, man managing them transvaginally. So I think this idea of counseling patients that even with revision, you're always going to have pain. Um, I've seen those patients, I've seen patients counseled in that way. And that's, that's troubling to me. I think with proper, uh, simple diagnostic um, approach, I think you, you can make these patients better. The caveat being, admittedly, there are parts of the country that are inundated with more poorly done strap-based meshes, which could be more complex. Kind of changing topics a little bit. Do you have you all been using more biologic crafts in the in you know given what's going on when you are thinking about augmenting or repair? Roger, you want to take that? Yeah, we, you know I will. We we spent probably about five six years before the evolution of Uphold in a in a phase where we're doing a lot of biologics for anterior apical um, prolapse and for uterine preservation, and that sort of bridged into our use of mesh. Um, it's a good procedure. It's a beautiful looking outcome. Um, over time, we had, a, we had about a 68% reduction in cystoceles, I think at one to two years. When we tried to look again after four to five years, uh, it wasn't clear that the numbers were as impressive as mesh. So I don't think that it duplicates the type of delta you're going to see with your anterior apical outcomes and overall lack of recurrence. Um, so it's in the toolbox. Have I gone back to using a lot of biologics? Uh, a year and a half ago, I might have thought that would be the case, but I really haven't. I've focused more on, um, on native tissue and on a little bit more abdominal than I used to in the past. Yeah, I can tell you what we're doing in, in our center, and actually Will knows this because he's reviewing the data right now for us, because uh, we've been using biologic graphs mostly in the posterior compartment for many years. What, 2006, I think we went back to, or 2008? And... Um, and we're, we're actually submitting an abstract on that now. And, and we're finding the same thing, Roger. Uh, and, but part of the problem is it's not a, you know, we, we could compare it to native tissue posterior repairs, uh, but we're not seeing a significant difference. The problem is it's not a randomized trial. Mm -hmm. So the question is, when do we pull out the biologic? And if I get into the rectovaginal space and I see good fascia, I'll just pull it together do a site-specific repair, and that's the end of it. But if I open up the, the posterior vaginal wall and all I see is fat and nothing, then that person 
is going to get a biologic. So I talked to them about it before that I might use it. And she's definitely at, she was at risk anyway, because she has so little tissue. So I feel like it's the least we can do because bringing, bringing fat and placating it to fat is not going to do anything. So these patients, I think, are inherently at a higher risk of failure. I do want to say that um, I, I'm disappointed that we haven't taken this past decade of, of increased mesh concern to have better supportive randomized data about biologics. All of the RCTs about biologics, uh, most, some of them show anatomic benefit, none of them show subjective benefit, and none of them use a device that you can currently buy. So we're sort of, again, in the wild west of, um, in terms of randomized controlled trials about what's going to apply. I think most of us do feel like in individualized cases, it's probably beneficial, but it's hard to prove. I, th I think it might be interesting for future webinar to talk about best practices with native tissue repair. Even this one issue, which we can't dwell on now, of a gap defect posteriorly, it's interesting, and I think it's worth debating. And there's, there's some literature and obviously a lot of personal experience to guide us. Um, maybe a time for just a few more questions. We've had, you know, there's some fellows are talking about a lot more requests for autologous pubovaginal slings. Um, what are your thoughts on kind of the data around that? I mean, it's clearly it's a little bit more morbid than the the synthetic midirythral slings, but um, at least from a patient side, there's been a lot more interest in that. Uh, uh, rectus fascia slings or fascia lata slings? Yeah. Well, I mean, at least we, you know, we do have the sister trial showing that it's uh, it's better than a birch, um, than an open birch anyway. Uh, clearly, it's got more morbidity. Um, I think that uh, uh, it's still, it, it's not common in my practice. Um, what about you guys? Well, you know, I'll just add that, and I think this is important for the fellows on the call, historically, um, just to go back, slings, before the TVT and all of those, you know, types of midirethral slings, Slings were reserved for the worst cases, right? Including rectus fascial slings. They were reserved for patients with recurrent incontinence, stress incontinence, for intrinsic sphincter deficiency. Uh, and it was only when the TVT and those procedures came out that slings became treatment for primary stress incontinence. So rectus fascial slings were not originally designed as a primary procedure for stress incontinence. They were the salvage operation. The birch was intended for, uh, for primary stress incontinence. So, and, and that's, as, as Charlie said, that's what's so important is that rectus fascial slings are more morbid procedures. They have more wound infections. They have more pain. Uh, they, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's a lot of issues uh, with rectus fascial slings. So we, we do not do them routinely in our, in our practice either. We do more biologic slings, with uh, you know cadaveric, but not rectus fascial slings. Yeah, I agree. It's a little bit of kind of um, misplaced nostalgia for that operation. And the other factor I would add here too is the tension-free vaginal sling um, is unique in that if done correctly, it's very non-obstructive. And the idea of a rectus sling, even even slightly obstructing the bladder outlet, leads to higher risk of DO and um, irritated bladder symptoms, and not to mention slow voiding over time which the, these patients are just fundamentally not as happy as, um, as our modern sling patients as a whole. So I think that we have just about a minute left or so. Um, I don't know if anyone has any last minute comments. I think we've addressed most of the questions here, um, but I did just wanna, wanna thank, you know, th thank the three of you for, for agreeing to kind of present and, and sit on the panel and I thank the societies for their, their time and their commitment to this. Um, the fellows definitely appreciate it. Um, Sure. Thank you all. I, I do want to say I see a couple of questions uh, on the chat that I will try to respond to uh, offline. Yeah, and also I'll just say that you know maybe we can work with uh, the societies to some. There are a lot of questions that came in. Maybe we can work on some way of addressing those uh, offline. Great. And then just and then just again a reminder. Again, the, the next webinar will be on Tuesday, April fourteenth at five p.m. and that'll be on rectovaginal fistulas with Pat Culligan. Um, and the panelists will be Kim Kenton and Keisha Dyer. Um, you again can register for that on the OGS website. Um, if it's not up already, it will be up very shortly. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Stay well, stay safe. Bye-bye.